how do you write a bestseller? That was Land Rover's problem when it came to creating the second generation version of its runaway success story, the Range Rover Evoque, a car that now accounts for a third of the brand's total sales. It's a fashionable yet capable proposition that has fundamentally changed the premium mid-sized SUV market. Rivals now have to contend with an evolved version that features a more efficient range of diesel and petrol engines, including electrified and mild hybrid technology. Plus, there's smarter styling, superb ride quality, extra off-road ability, and more interior space thanks to an all-new PTA platform. As a result, if you want an SUV of this kind, this one's still a pretty complete proposition. It's now half a century since all-wheel driving was revolutionized by the Range Rover, a car these days a class apart in the luxury SUV sector. But what would that model look like reinvented in smaller form for very different millennial times, an age in which fashion and frugality are as important as toughness and traction? Well, something like this, we think, the second-generation Range Rover Evoque. This L551 series car might not look too much of a design departure, but it sets out to be just as revolutionary as the original model. Back in 2011, the launch of the very first Evoque represented a watershed moment for the Land Rover brand. Every bit as important as the arrival of the original Range Rover in 1970, the Discovery in 89 and the Freelander in 97. To survive, the mark knew that it had to reach the younger buyers, fueling the spectacular rising sales of crossovers and small SUVs. That meant the need for a fresh, very different compact model that would reflect a radical change in design, hence the futuristic LRX concept car from which the Evoque was developed before being launched to a rapturous reception. That first L538 series model accumulated 217 global awards in its eight-year production life, and 772,000 were sold in 116 countries. The UK accounted for around 20% of sales, and importantly for the brand, more than 60% of customers had never owned any Land Rover product before. More recently, though, the pitch has not looked so rosy for the Solihull maker. The company's been wrong-footed in the dash away from diesel, and now it faces increasing SUV competition from every part of the industry. Plus, the design of newer, compact rivals quickly highlighted the original Evoque model's rather cramped interior, its mediocre efficiency figures, and a Ford-derived platform that was looking ever more out of date which is why we've got this rejuvenated second generation model launched in early 2019. The visual continuity with its predecessor is intentional and it disguises the fact that almost everything has changed here. Starting with a new premium transverse architecture platform uh, which makes possible a whole new range of mild hybrid engines all developed as part of a £1 billion production line investment in this British built model. There's a plug-in version too. Thanks to a longer wheelbase, that more sophisticated chassis also gives this Evoque a better shot at a brief that its predecessor really struggled with, namely straddling both the compact and mid-sized premium SUV sectors. Now, it's still no bigger than a Focus outside, but there's now enough room inside for you to feel better about paying BMW X3 or Audi Q5 money for one, which, of course, is as vital for Land Rover as the installation of the kind of more premium cabin that you'd find in SUVs of that sort. That is now delivered by the single five-door body style on offer, as well as a range of really clever design innovations, including a clear sight virtual rear view mirror and a self-learning smart settings system that adjusts the car to your preferences as you approach it. Some things haven't changed though. The Evoque is still easily the most capable car in its segment off the beaten track. In short, it's still a proper Range Rover. It's just that now it feels a lot more like one. Let's put this car to the test.
Today's Evoque is a rather different thing to the original. Back in 2011, when it was also available in three-door coupe form, Land Rover wanted us to believe that this model could be part hot hatch and part SUV. It quickly evolved, though, into arguably what it should have been in the first place. A Range Rover shrunk into a more compact form for fashionable urban mobility. This positioning worked well for the original L538 series Mark I model, or at least it did until the diesel market shrunk alarmingly. Its prospects were enhanced by a 2015 facelift that brought new era Ingenium engines and the option of a short-lived convertible body style. But all along, the reality was that the unusual futuristic styling shrouded ancient underpinnings dating back to freelanders from the turn of the century. Today, in many ways, the opposite is true. Uh, the lightly evolved shape of this Mark II L551 series car looks reassuringly familiar, but the new premium transverse architecture chassis it sits on is cutting edge, or so we're told. Now, at first glance, that seems to be true. The PTA platform facilitates a longer wheelbase and it can support both plug-in and mild hybrid engines. On the other hand, though, in this day and age, uh, you would have expected it would have been able to take a full electric powertrain, it can't, and incorporate the weight-saving aluminium technology which is used in larger Range Rovers that uh, JLR's also been offering in a more compact SUV since it launched the Jaguar F-Pace in 2016. Instead, this Evoque sits on heavy steel beams and has to lug around the kind of curb weight you'd expect from a much larger model of this sort. In upper spec models, it's close to two tons. You could very reasonably point out that the premium compact SUVs this car must primarily compete against are also fundamentally fashioned from steel, but in, say, a Volvo XC40, a BMW X1 or an Audi Q3, that doesn't matter so much because off tarmac they don't need to be able to tackle anything more arduous than a light forest track. To be credibly true to its brand, the Evoque has to be more capable than that on rougher terrain, which partly, but not completely, a accounts for a weight penalty over its rivals that can in some cases be 300 kilos or more. Now that certainly doesn't help its efficiency prospects, uh, we're going to get to that later in the film. And in terms of drive dynamics, it also takes this car about as far away from that original hot hatch SUV concept as it's possible to get. Even in its fastest forms, there's nothing particularly sporty about the handling and feel of this model. But in many ways, that's fine. JLR has the Jaguar E-Pace, another rather portly compact SUV for customers wanting a sharper feeling posh small crossover. And the solid structure's hefty feel rather fits with this evokes evolved maturity into more of a fully fledged Range Rover product. As part of that, the development team did an awful lot of work on ride quality, borrowing the integral link rear suspension from the larger Velar and mating it with the vibration killing hydroelastic bushes used on a fully sized Range Rover and it's paid off magnificently. Nothing else in this class cruises uh, over the bumps as well as an Evoque. It's a major selling point. The steering is well weighted and refinement's better too, thanks in part to a 13% improvement in the body body shells torsional rigidity, although if rapid progress is called for, you won't always be able to appreciate that fully because the engines need to be worked hard to shift all that metalwork. Virtually all the units on offer use the currently fashionable mild hybrid technology and that's similar to the sort of thing that you find in Mercedes and Audi models to recover braking energy which is then stored in a lithium ion battery beneath the rear seat for use during low speed driving and also to boost performance when you're accelerating. These part electrified engines are all developments of the previous model's 2.0-litre Ingenium series units with horsepower outputs referenced by their name designations. In fact, the entry-level front-driven manual D150 diesel variant has pretty much exactly the same conventional power plant used in the previous generation version of this car. Uh, rest to 62 miles an hour takes 10.5 seconds en route to 125 mph, but few customers will choose that model, probably not so much because it lacks mild hybrid tech, but more because it can't be had with the automatic transmission that most will want. 
In fact, you can't have any front-driven Evoque with an auto gearbox, which seems something of an oversight on Land Rover's part, given the way that that kind of combination is so popular with obvious rivals. For a self-shifter, you'll need an all-wheel drive part electrified Evoque. In fact, you have to have the provided ZF 9-speed auto on every other model in the range. The mainstream diesel lineup is propped up by a mild hybrid all-wheel drive version of the D150, but we can't imagine why you'd ever choose it, given that a frankly inconsequential premium gets you the same engine in D180 form, getting you to 62 miles an hour nearly two seconds quicker. Uh, the quoted figure is 9.3 seconds en route to 127 miles an hour. There's much more pulling power too. 430 newton meters plays 380, uh, though the two ton maximum towing weight remains the same. Here we're trying the same unit in its flagship D240 state of tune, which really would make a good tow car uh, with 500 newton meters of grunt. The performance stats are 7.7 .7 seconds and 140 miles an hour. In truth, this top diesel unit doesn't feel anything like that fast. Uh, the weight issue exacerbated by the uh, gearbox's reluctance to shift down as quickly as you might want when a rapid burst of speed's called for. Uh, the extent to which you feel this is surprising given that one of the benefits of the mild hybrid tech is supposed to be the way that it can provide a little electric boost from low revs to torque fill while you're waiting for the turbo to spool up, so helping acceleration from low speeds. With the lighter petrol models, you notice that sort of thing far less, but here the gearbox can be rather too eager to change down and fire the revs towards the 6,500 RPM redline, which doesn't really facilitate quiet or luxuriously rapid progress if you've deadlines to meet. Unless you'll merely be using your Evoque for short hops, we'd probably counsel against the base P200 model, uh, in which 320 newton meters of torque doesn't really feel enough to shift everything along. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily know that from that variant stats though. Rest to 62 in 8 seconds on the way to 134 miles an hour. For mixed motoring and a conventional petrol version of this car, you'd be better off with either the mid-range P250, which improves those figures to 7 seconds and 143 miles an hour, or the top P300, which enhances them further to 6.3 seconds and 150 mph. As we'll observe further in our cost of ownership section, all these two litre mild hybrid petrol units rather like a drink, which if you're set on fueling from the green pump, uh, might tempt you towards the alternative plug-in variant that you can ask your dealer about. Now here, the engine in question is properly new from the ground up, rather than merely being an older power plant that's been uh, embellished with a fashionable bit of battery tech. With an Evoque PHEV, you get a three cylinder 1.5 litre petrol unit putting out 197 HP and boosted with a 107 HP electric motor. You might conceivably be put off by the asking price but otherwise in our view it's a hugely better proposition than the conventional petrol units. The PHEV package does add on a few kilograms though, slightly nullifying the way that a lighter petrol evoke turns into corners with a touch more eagerness than the diesel version. Uh, the all-wheel drive system in most models uses an efficient driveline setup that works like most other 4x4 packages in this segment, uh, employing a driveline disconnect system which cuts out the prop shaft and the rear axle when they're no longer required and which will leave you at the will of a front-driven evoke for most of the time. For the top D240 and P300 variants though, Land Rover fits a GKN developed active drive line, uh, which uses a clever twin multiplate clutch to manage torque and wheel spin across the back wheels, maximizing traction when you're cornering at speed. It's basically a more sophisticated version of the torque management by braking system. Now that's retained for the front wheels on all evokes. Uh, every model can also, on request, be fitted with optional adaptive dynamics, adaptive damping, and that can be paired with a configurable dynamic screen uh, that enables you to tailor the handling of a car to suit your precise requirements. 
but other small SUVs will serve you better if you're determined to drive on your door handles. None, though, can hold a candle to this one off the beaten track. Let's be clear, if you're shopping in this sector and you think a car of this kind is, well, pretty pointless if it can't go very far off-road, then you have to buy this one. It's really as simple as that. It doesn't, of course, get the air suspension that lifts larger Range Rovers loftily away from terra firma, but that kind of complexity really isn't needed at this price point. In any case, the Evoque's 212mm ground clearance is already vastly better than the competition, and it facilitates an increased 600mm wading capability. To give you some perspective, that's 150 mils deeper than you can go in our rival Volvo XC40. Uh, that is a more significant stat than the impressive quoted approach and departure angle figures, uh, 25 degrees at the front and 30.6 degrees at the rear. After all, uh, though you won't want to cross the Serengeti get in this car, you might very well come across a deep winter flood. What's so impressive about the Evoque's off-piste capability is how easy it is to use, thanks primarily to Land Rover's much-admired terrain response system. Now, this has settings for on-road use too, eco and comfort, plus there's an extra dynamic mode if you fitted the adaptive dynamics damping package. But where it really shines is off the beaten track, where you can select specific grass, gravel, snow, mud and ruts, and sand options to suit the land that you're driving over. Over. Our only previous criticism of this setup and the old model was its lack of a set and forget auto setting, but even that's been addressed now with the improved Terrain Response 2 package, which features here in this car. Uh, once you've made your selection from the various modes, it's really just a case of leaving the car's electronics to work out how best to dole out power and maximize traction, sniffing out grip where none seems to exist, and turning this Evoke into to a really impressively capable all-road driving machine. Try to approach what this car can do in extremis at the wheel of any other small SUV in this sector and you'd damage the thing and you'd probably be lucky not to disable it. And there's more. All Evoke variants get the same hill launch assist and hill descent control systems that you'd find in larger Range Rover models. Plus, uh, there's a low traction launch feature, which helps you to pull away smoothly from a standstill on very slippery surfaces. And there's also what's called all-terrain progress control. Now, this is essentially a kind of low-speed cruise control that helps you to maintain steady progress in extreme off-road conditions. All the while, a 4x4 menu in the center dash screen helps to brief you on slope information, uh, steering wheel angles, driveline torque distribution, suspension articulation and weight sensing data. If you're planning to use very much of this capability, even occasionally, then we would recommend a further investment in the optional ground sight clear view forward camera system. Now that's a so-called transparent bonnet setup that allows you to easily identify potentially damaging rocks and tree roots that you might be just about to drive over. Now this neat package uses a combined feed from the cameras in the grille and also beneath the mirrors to bring up a digital field of vision on the central infotainment screen here which is some 15 meters across and 8.5 meters deep. Your front wheels are ghosted into the display to help you place the car. But of course, most likely owners won't really require any of this sort of prowess. For them, the Evoque will continue to be a fashionable family trinket with capability and reserve for the few times it'll be needed. What's magnificent about this car, though, is in comparison to its rivals, when those times occur, uh, let's say when you venture from your front door to discover that the world's covered by a thick blanket of snow, there is that satisfying feeling of having a product that's in its element. It it's a bit like having a supercar and unexpectedly finding yourself at a racetrack. Outside of a Land Rover showroom, no other compact SUV can deliver that, which is why no other car of this kind is quite like an Evoque.
You don't change a winning formula. The way the original Evoke looked was the major reason why so many people bought it. Stylist Massimo Fraschella and his team did initially design a more radical concept for this second generation model, but it was quickly discarded on the basis of continual customer feedback that the established shape should merely be evolved. Perhaps, though, with a little extra touch of Range Rover this time around. That earlier L538 model was originally destined to wear a Land Rover badge. This one, though, uh, which carries over only its door hinges from its predecessor, gains more than a hint of the maturity that marks out the next Range Rover model up in the line, the mid-sized Velar. You notice that, especially here at the rear, the most strikingly changed part of this car, thanks to this broad black accent panel that stretches across the tailgate to give a sense of visual width. Purposeful touches include the sweeping directional indicators that feature within the narrower LED tail lamps on plusher models and the way that the uh, lower skid plate flows up overtly into the bumper section. As before, a neat roof spoiler tops things off. At the front, every Evoque gets these ultra-slim LED headlights, which on virtually all models feature this unique daytime running light signature and which can now be upgraded to full adaptive matrix status for a beam that's tailored to road conditions and surrounding traffic. Otherwise, the front end look will depend quite a lot on whether you've ordered the optional R Dynamic Pack. It's available on all trim levels, which adds twin ribs for these redesigned corner cutouts, faux vents further up the bonnet, and a slightly more overt version of this lower skid plate. The side profile is 100% Evoque. For previous owners, the rising waistline, the shallow glass house and the plunging roof line will be instantly familiar. But even here, a touch of Velar has crept in, perhaps most evidently with these retractable door pulls, which look great when they're flush with the bodywork, but which have a coffin handle-like vibe when they're extended. Uh, we've also noted much better paint quality and shut lines, which are virtually halved in size. The swept back roof line, which which of course as here and as before can be contrast coloured, is now 11 millimetres lower. That compensates perhaps for the lack of a three-door coupe body shape this time around. Uh, sadly, there's no follow-up to the old convertible model either. The neat way that on the old model, the exaggerated front wheel arch uh, interrupted the styling flow out of the front headlamp into this vent-style trimming strip has been retained and that's been extended further back below this restyled door mirror and larger wheel rim sizes can be had in arches that no longer feature black cladding. 17 inch alloys feature on the base spec but most variants are fitted out with the 20 inch rims that we have here and even larger 21 inches are available on request. What's more significant, though, is what you can't see. Now, Land Rover is keen to talk about this Mark II model's premium transverse architecture platform uh, that makes possible the installation of its fresh, mild hybrid engine range. But it's a touch disappointing to find that to be a predominantly steel structure, which has actually added quite a lot of weight to this car. Uh, now, that delivers the rather confusing conundrum of a car that is slightly smaller than, say, a compact Audi Q3 premium SUV at the same time as being slightly heavier than a mid-sized Audi Q5. A car like this one, no larger than a Focus, should never weigh nearly 1.8 tonnes. That's as heavy as the much larger Range Rover Velar, which benefits from the aluminium platform that we'd like to have seen installed here. Size, of course, is important. 70% of likely evoked buyers are urban-based, and they were clear that they didn't want the previous model's 4.37 metre length to grow, so Land Rover had to satisfy them while at the same time addressing the most frequently criticised issue with that old car, that of cramped interior space. The obvious solution was to move the front and rear axles further apart, creating this L551 series model's 20 millimeter longer wheelbase, which is claimed has made a big difference to cabin space inside. Let's take a look. Well, what a change. There were lots of things you could say about the original model's interior, but one thing was always certain. It never made you feel like you were in a fully-fledged Range Rover. This cabin does. Now, if you come to this car uh, seeking differentiation from the original, 
this is where you're gonna find it. Once cramped and blandly trimmed, this lighter, larger, smarter cabin can now better justify the premium prices that Land Rover wants to charge. You sit lower than you would do in a larger Range Rover model, of course. Uh, there is a higher window line and you can't see as much of the bonnet, but the view out is still a little more commanding than it is with obvious rivals, uh, as the higher ride height led us to expect it would be. Now, if you've owned or frequently driven an Evoque before, you'll notice the key changes immediately. Uh, the replacement of that past its sell-by date circular gear selector by this uh, pistol grip F-type sports car derived shifter, the much wider centre console between the seats, the far classier dished stitched steering wheel, and if you've avoided the two cheaper trim levels, an arguably class-leading level of infotainment screen provision when you fire up the ignition. Yes, as with other Range Rover models, this one now gets the brand's Panasonic developed Touch Pro Duo twin screen setup. This is Land Rover's vision of a buttonless future where most of the controls lie in menus behind toughened glass, but you still retain an important analog element courtesy of these two large configurable rotary dials that uh, float above this lower screen. Both primarily deal with cabin temperature or when pushed uh, seat climate functions and the left hand one can also deal um, with your uh, desired terrain response driving mode settings. In between there's a proper volume dial so you don't have to stab away at a touch screen or at a steering wheel button to change the audio output. Uh, we would like to have seen the addition of Audi style haptic touch feedback though as it is uh, you quite often have to take your eyes off the road for too long to see exactly what it is you're selecting and that's something that's exacerbated by the placement of the lower screen a little too far down the center stack. In most other respects though these screens work beautifully offering you the ability to better configure the functions that you want to prioritize. For example, it's perfectly possible for the driver to view a navigation map on the upper display whilst your passenger adjusts media settings on the one below. Now you simply can't do that with the single monitor that rivals offer. We love the graphic definition too, especially in the terrain response section and the fact that you can alter the angle of this flush fitting top screen to suit your driving position. Plus, uh, providing you avoid entry-level trim, Land Rover now at last includes the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring systems, which every rival offers, as well as its own in-control apps package. Uh, lots of screen options then, so many in fact, that you'd probably need an evening or two with the manual to really get your head around all the various screen choices. Anything the Touch Pro Duo setup can't tell you will almost certainly be covered off by the instruments that you view through this imposing four-spoke thin-rimmed wheel, above which you can also have an optional head-up display projecting key commands onto the bottom of the windscreen. In place of the conventional analog dials that you'll find on the lower spec of Oaks, high-end models like this one now feature the kind of all-digital instrument binnacle that's been a design feature on the larger Range Rovers for some time. This 12.3-inch interactive driver display isn't quite as intuitive as, uh, say, the virtual cockpit setup that you'll find in a rival Audi, but there are lots of configurable options controlled by touch sensitive switches on the wheel here. Now these allow you to view either one or two dials together with formats that prioritize either navigation, trip computer, media or off-road setting info alongside them. Or you can fill the instrument binnacle screen with a full map layout. It's up to you. As for cabin quality, well, hidden cheaper plastics are in evidence if you really search for them, but broadly what's on offer here gets close to meeting the high standard set by a fully fledged plutocrat Range Rover, which is praise indeed. Uh, slender air vents fit with the minimalistic ambiance, and these individual armrests are a nice touch, though it is a pity that they can't be adjusted for height. Uh, the seats are good too, heated across the range, but unfortunately lacking lumbar support unless you stretch to a pair with 14-way electric adjustment. On the subject of seats, the brand thinks that many buyers will want to choose between various sustainable upholstery finishes uh, with the eucalyptus textile and ultra fabrics faux leather combination likely to be the most popular as an 
alternative though, you might prefer what's fitted here, uh, a premium textile mix developed with fashionable European upholstery specialist Kvadrat uh, and blended with Dynamica suede cloth that's fashioned from uh, 53 recycled bottles worth of plastic per evoke. Uh, you might feel rather guilty about specifying ordinary leather after considering that, but uh, it is there if you want it. What else? Uh, well, there's not much wrong with the general ergonomics, although the narrow rear window and the slim glass house do slightly limit rearward vision and they make essential the standard rear parking sensors and the rear view camera. Uh, neither of those features will help much with rear vision at ordinary road speeds, of course, but for a little extra, Land Rover can sell you a feature that does. Uh, so let's say that you're carrying bulky luggage or lanky passengers, which uh, obscure your view back. Now with this clear sight uh, feature fitted to the rear view mirror, you can simply click the mirror surface into a roof camera fed widescreen view of the road behind. Um, equally neat is another option and that's the ground sight clear view forward camera system and that uses cameras below the front bumper to show an image of what's underneath the uh, front end of the car on the upper central touch pro screen. Uh, that's very handy when you're off-roading or when you're parking in tight spaces. Interior storage space, uh, previously an issue for Evoke buyers, has been much improved with this second generation model. Uh, Land Rover has at last made it possible to get a properly sized 1.5 litre bottle of water into the door bins and the 4.5 litre central cubby between the seats is much bigger than before, incorporating a micro SIM slot, a 12 volt port and twin USBs, two of six that can be scattered around the cabin. Now this storage area sits just behind a shallow tray which lifts away to reveal a couple of cup holders uh, while further forward there's a hidden area behind the centre stack that's large enough to take a tablet with narrow pen slots on either side. The glove box which incorporates a pen clip is also decently sized. Uh, there's an overhead compartment for your sunglasses and there are ticket clips here on the sun visors. Time to take a seat in the rear. Now, as you expect, thanks to the 20 millimeter wheelbase increase we uh, referenced earlier, this second generation Evoque is now easier for rear seat passengers to get into, and it's more accommodating for parents strapping in their offspring. Of course, it is what it is. No matter how much you extend the length between the axles of a car like this, there's only so much legroom that you're going to be able to create. And the Evoque's cause here isn't helped by the lack of the kind of uh, slide and recline function for this rear bench that you'd get in a rival Audi Q3 or a BMW X1 model. And also on much smaller SUVs, actually. Uh, still, this Land Rover now makes better use of the room it has. It's now easier to slide your feet under the front chairs and there's 20 millimetres more knee room, and that's helped by these uh, scalloped out seat backs. As a result, one six foot adult could sit behind another reasonably easily. Despite the lower exterior roof height, headroom's not bad either, even with this huge panoramic glass top fitted. As usual with a car in this class, three adults sat back here are going to need to be on friendly terms, but the centre occupant's cause will be helped by a notably low centre transmission tunnel, above which are twin vents and a 12 volt socket. Uh, deep door bins, seat back pockets, LED reading lights and a centre armrest with twin cup holders all feature and an appropriately premium feel is enhanced by these stitched door cards which here feature Quadrat textile inserts. As for luggage room, well, let's see. Now, we still think it's a pity that the futuristic styling doesn't permit the fitment of that signature Range Rover feature, the two-piece tailgate. Uh, this single-piece hatch uh, on this particular car is powered. That's a feature you actually only get as standard if you're happy to pay rather a lot for your Evoque. Gesture activation is, of course, optional. 
The luggage area, once it's revealed, is 10% larger than before. Land Rover quotes a figure of 591 litres. That is misleading because instead of being based around the usual floor to parcel shelf measurement, that references floor to ceiling dimensions. So it's probably more relevant to tell you that golf clubs now fit in sideways, as will a couple of suitcases stored lengthwise alongside each other. In total, uh, five carry-on cases can be accommodated, which isn't bad, but it is a bit less than you'd fit into a rival BMW X1 or Volvo XC40. And it's way less than you'd be able to cram into the mid-sized BMW X3 and Volvo XC60 SUVs that much of the Evoque range is priced against. Still, if you need more from an SUV at this price point, then your Land Rover dealer will walk you over to the Discovery Sport model on the other side of the showroom. Is the space on offer really usable? Well, the wider opening certainly helps. A folded pram apparently now goes in much more easily, despite the increased size of the fuel tank. Laudably, the battery pack that features in the plug-in hybrid variant doesn't impinge on trunk space either. Uh, the absence of an adjustable height boot floor is a bit disappointing, but lots of small SUVs lack that. This one's cargo base uh, folds back to reveal a usefully compartmentalized lower area, but provision for that is only possible because the brand continues with its disappointing policy of not equipping Evoque models as standard with any kind of spare wheel. Just one of those irritating tyre repair kits which ought to not be acceptable in such a capable off-roader. In terms of further trunk area practicality, you get uh, this netted area on the right and Land Rover hasn't forgotten to include a 12 volt socket, it's here on the left, plus there are bag hooks on either side and four silver tie down points. If you need room for long, narrow items like skis, you'll be pleased to find that the rear bench now has a centre folding panel as part of a 40-20-40 split. Longer activity equipment can't be accommodated inside due to the lack of a fold-forward front seat back option, but if you push everything flat, uh, a usefully large area is revealed which Land Rover rates at 1,383 litres in size. This time around, there's only this five-door body style, no three-door coupe, and sadly, no convertible either. Prices have risen, of course, and a little more than you might think from a casual glance. Although, in theory, it is possible to buy yourself an Evoque for around £32,000, in practice, hardly anyone ever will. That sum only gets you the entry-level, base-spec, manual transmission D150 diesel variant, which lacks all-wheel drive and the latest mild hybrid engineering. And that's a version that we think very few potential customers will want to consider. For the majority of typical buyers, the real entry point to the range will lie with the all-wheel drive, automatic, mild hybrid models that from launch came with prices starting in the 35 to £36,000 bracket, either the D150 150hp diesel or for £860 more, the alternative P200 200hp petrol derivative. Those figures, of course, only get you base trim. The vast majority of Evoque buyers pay more for the S, SE, or as in this case, H. SE grades and you have to stretch at least as far as SE to get the more sophisticated Touch Pro Duo twin screen interior that you'll probably have admired in the showroom, which actually means a starting spend likely to be in the 42 to 45,000 pound bracket uh, depending on engine choice. But of course, an Evoque could cost you a lot more than that, especially if it's at least to some extent bespoke to your preferences and you've made a possibly expensive foray into the options list. And of course, a more powerful engine will add significantly to the price too. Uh, the strongest seller is the mid-range D180 diesel. We've gone further here with the D240 diesel. Plus there are Gutsia P250 and P300 petrol versions too. And you can also talk to your dealer about a plug-in hybrid variant. Now that pairs a 197 HP three-cylinder 1.5 litre petrol engine with a 107 HP electric motor. Once you've selected a trim level and a power plant to match, before you start on final spec, your dealer will also want to know whether you'd like to pay an extra £1,500 for a slightly sportier look and feel, courtesy of the optional R-Dynamic pack. 
that's available with all variants. Now, this adds a whole lot of extra trim detailing, principally ribbed front corner outlets, bonnet louvres, uh, a smarter front and rear bumper, and valance design, and inside metal pedals, an ebony Mortzine headliner, and black gear shift paddles for the auto gearbox. Now, it's worth saying at this point what you might be thinking, that list prices aren't the overriding issue when it comes to the way that you might be seeking to take ownership of this car. Only 30% of Evoke customers buy outright. The remainder purchase through PCP Finance, and that means uh, that their pricing point of reference is not, say, a 50K car, but a £400 a month car. This Range Rover's model's class-leading residuals come into play here, and that means that with a £7,000 deposit, an entry-level Evoke could, from launch, cost you as little as £245 a month. Now, that is less than you'd pay for a apparently cheap arrivals from lesser brands. So if you're, well, slightly discouraged by the list figures that we've been quoting, your prospects for getting yourself into a perfectly specced example of one of these might be rather brighter than you might at first think. Anyway, that's given you a feel for Evoke pricing and range structure. Let's now position this, uh, the most compact Range Rover contender, for you in terms of the Soli Hellmaker's wider model lineup. Size-wise, the most obvious comparison to make is with the brand's Land Rover entry-level model, the Discovery Sport, uh, a more spacious but less fashionable alternative which shares much of this car's engineering and technology. Now, some Discovery Sport variants, uh, the base diesel and petrol versions, for example, they are priced very similarly to their Evoque counterparts. In other cases, though, with the volume D180 diesel variants, for example, a Disco Sport could cost around £5,000 more than an equivalent of Oak, uh, which you might think reasonable given that most sport models can seat up to seven. A uh, perhaps more relevant brand comparison is with the Range Rover series model that sits directly above this Evoke, the Velar. Now, one of those commands a premium of around £10,000 over a directly comparable Evoke. Let's get on to the question of how mainstream variants of this car square up to potential premium C-segment SUV sector rivals from other premium brands. And let's use the volume D150 and D180 diesel variants that the vast majority of Evoke customers choose as our benchmark. Uh, before we get started, there is a basic issue here. What size of premium SUV do you perceive this to be? Is it a compact model like, say, a BMW X1 or an Audi Q3 or a mid size model like, say, a BMW X3 or an Audi Q5. Dimensionally, there's no doubt that the Evoque falls amongst cars in the smaller category, but Land Rover says that's intentional for urban manoeuvrability. The company reckons that the extra interior space made possible by their second generation design's longer wheelbase leaves it equally able to target the larger mid-sized models that sell in the 40 to 50,000 pound price bracket, which is, as we said earlier, the price span that the most desirable part of the Evoque range now falls into. To. For simplicity's sake, for competitive price comparisons, we're going to stick with premium models in the compact SUV segment here. If you're buying in this class, you might already be aware that this car shares some of its engineering with another Jaguar Land Rover compact SUV product, the Jaguar E-Pace, which costs a fraction less and is sportier to drive, but which is smaller inside and nothing like as good off-road. It is more likely, though, that an Evoque buyer would be looking at small SUVs from the premium sector market leaders, uh, cars like BMW's X1, Audi's Q3, the Mercedes GLA and the Volvo XC40. The Volvo and the BMW will cost you fractionally less than directly comparable Evoque models, but the asking figures for directly equivalent versions of the Mercedes and the Audi would probably be much the same. And Evoque very creditably manages to combine at least, if not more, of the interior space that you get in models like those with something of the sportier, swept-back silhouette of the various coupe-style small SUV models that are now springing up in the segment, cars like the BMW X2 and the Audi Q3 Sportback. Now, both offer a small saving over Land Rover's pricing, but offer less interior space. 
Other potential customers may bemoan the lack of a full hybrid self-charging engine in this car. Uh, these being people that would direct to the likeable Lexus UX, although again, that's much more inside. Uh, similar self-charging hybrid technology is used by that Japanese brand's other fractionally larger compact SUV contender, the Lexus NX. Now that comes with pricing starting at around £36,000. Those are all your really direct alternatives to an Evoque, but if you want to widen your search to include volume branded SUVs in this price band, then you absolutely can. Toyota's RAV4, now only offered as a hybrid, sells in the 30 to 37,000 pound bracket for those who want to trade a premium badge for extra engine technology. Otherwise, if you're spending that kind of sum on an SUV crossover of this kind, you could get yourself a, a really top spec version of a smaller mid-sized model like a Nissan Qashqai, a Seat Atka or a Ford Cougar. B, a mid to top spec version of a slightly larger mid-sized model like a Volkswagen Tiguan, a Mazda CX-5 or a Honda CR-V. Or C, a similarly equipped version of a seven seat mid-sized SUV like a Volkswagen Tiguan Allspace or a DS7 Crossback. Lots and lots of choices then, but arguably nothing with the proper SUV credentials of an Evoque. If having considered all that, you conclude it is this little Range Rover product that you really want, then you're going to need to know exactly what's included in the standard spec. Well, there's plenty, even if you opt for entry-level trim. You're reminded of the sheer capability of this car with the news that all volume four-wheel drive variants get Land Rover's optimum suite of off-road driving tools, a terrain response two package that allows you via various selectable modes to set this car up to suit the ground that you're traversing. Plus there's a low traction launch setup, there's hill launch assist, there's hill descent control and all terrain progress control. That's a kind of off-road cruise control. Given the off-piste capability that all that creates, it is a little disappointing though to find that you have to pay extra for a space saver spare wheel. Still, there are a few other key equipment emissions, so even with the least expensive Evoque trim level, you get a specification that uh, truly befits a car wearing the luxury Range Rover badge. That means 17-inch alloy wheels, full LED headlights, auto headlamps and wipers, all-round parking sensors, a heated windscreen and a volumetric alarm. And inside, features like automatic two-zone climate control, ambient lighting, cruise control, a 40-20-40 split rear bench and a rear view camera, plus heated front seats that are eight-way manually adjustable. In addition, all Evokes now include the 10-inch screen Touch Pro infotainment system that only featured on the priciest versions of the previous model. This setup includes a DAB sound system, all your necessary connection sockets and Bluetooth phone connectivity. Uh, the package also includes what Land Rover calls In Control Protect, and that's a system that will automatically call the emergency services with your exact location if the airbags activate in an accident. Plus, it also gives you a downloadable remote app functionality that can show the location of your vehicle, update you on its fuel and fluid levels, tell you if the windows have been left open, and also allow you to download journey information. A pretty complete tally then, but as suggested earlier, you'll probably want more and find yourself choosing between the S, the SE and HSE grades that account for the vast majority of sales. S-Spec adds larger 18-inch wheels, auto-dimming power folding mirrors and an adaptive speed limiter that can set itself to prevailing speed limits courtesy of traffic sign recognition. Inside, in an S-Spec variant, you get perforated grained leather seats with 10-way power adjustability at the front, plus full navigation, part of the big step up in media connectivity that you get at this level in the range. Now that includes a smartphone pack and that will allow you to view and use all your favourite phone apps either via your choice of Apple CarPlay or Android Auto smartphone mirroring or alternatively by using Land Rover's own in-control apps package. Uh, just as clever is the included 
Connect Pro Pack. Now that gives you the brand's pack of pro services, which update you on traffic congestion, add satellite and street level imagery to the GPS system. Uh, it gives you an online search function for journeying information and allows door-to-door -door routing via which uh, navigation to a set destination continues on your smartphone so that after you park, uh, you're guided to the very door of your destination address. Uh, the Connect Pro Pack also allows you to create in your Evoke a mobile Wi-Fi hotspot for up to eight electronic devices. And it also includes the brand's super clever smart setting system, which uses artificial intelligence algorithms to learn your driving preferences, things like seat positions, plus music and climate settings, uh, which adjust themselves as you approach the car. All of that comes on an S-Spoke Evoque. As mentioned earlier though, you'll need to stretch at least as far as mid-range SE trim if you want this car's cabin in its most sophisticated form, complete with the twin central infotainment screens of the Touch Pro Duo setup and the fully digital interactive driver display that replaces the conventional dials in the instrument cluster. SE spec also gets you larger 20-inch wheels, scrolling, animated directional indicators, a powered tailgate and premium headlamps with auto high beam assist and signature daytime running lights. There's also a park pack that gives you 360 degree sensors, a park assist system which will automatically steer you into spaces, uh, a rear traffic monitor which warns you of oncoming vehicles when you're reversing out of a parking space and a clear exit monitor that warns of a possible threat when you're preparing to open a rear door from the inside. The final step in the trim hierarchy is HSE, which is what we have here. Such variants are recognizable by their gloss mid-silver diamond turned finish applied to the 20-inch wheel rims. Inside, HSE models stand apart too, thanks to the inclusion of softer, smarter Windsor leather upholstery and an upgraded steering wheel with a classy Atlas center bezel. At this level of the range, you also get keyless entry, an upgraded Meridian sound system, 16-way front seat adjustability and the clever clear sight interior rear view mirror which sees the rear view camera act like a rear view mirror if your view via the normal physical item is obscured say by rear passengers or by cargo area luggage. Uh, there's also gesture functionality for the powered tailgate and a drive pack that gives you blind spot assist along with adaptive cruise control. Plus, it builds on the standard autonomous braking functionality, that's something that we're going to get onto in a moment, with a high-speed emergency braking system. On to options, and as you might expect from a premium brand, there is a vast selection of extras for potential buyers to choose from. Uh, let's bring a few key ones to your attention. Uh, the clear sight virtual rear view mirror we've already mentioned. Uh, now, depending on the way you use your car, you'll either see that as a must have extra or a needless gadget. Uh, the optional ground sight clear view forward camera system, that would probably fall into the same category. Uh, it's uh, jolly handy when you're off-roading or parking parking in tight spaces. Now, if you're into lifestyle activities, then we would also recommend the optional activity key. Uh, that's a waterproof, shockproof wristband with an integrated transponder. Now, when you're wearing that, you can lock the key in the car and remove the anxiety of losing it. And when you return from rock climbing or canoeing or biking or whatever it is you do. All you do is hold the wristband near to the boot badge and it opens the tailgate so you can access the ordinary key fob where it'll have been safely stowed away. Now the activity key doesn't have a battery so it'll never run out of power. What else? Uh, well, on base and S-Spec Evokes, you can add the Touch Pro Duo twin center dash screens and the interactive driver display digital instrument cluster for only a few hundred more. Across the range, you might be tempted by a head-up display, a cabin air ionization package with or without an air quality sensor and configurable ambient lighting. Plus, maybe also one of the two Meridian audio system upgrades. There's a 10-speaker package or a 14-speaker surround sound setup 
Uh, curiously, front fog lights cost extra on all models, and you can upgrade the LED headlights with matrix technology, which will allow them to adapt elements of their beam to road conditions and other vehicles. Uh, you might also want privacy glass, a solar attenuated windscreen, a TV tuner, keyless entry, and the panoramic glass roof that we have here. That's available in either fixed or sliding form. Uh, you might want to spend a bit of money on the front seats, depending on the spec you've chosen. These can be upgraded with 10, 14 or 16-way powered adjustment. Uh, the latter two options feature lumbar support, plus the chairs can be specified with uh, cooling and massaging functions and the rear bench, that can be heated too. As I mentioned, uh, nearly all models get leather upholstery, but you can upgrade that to softer perforated Windsor leather, or you can swap it out for more eco-friendly sustainable fabric options, either a eucalyptus textile and ultra fabrics faux leather combination, or as here, a combination of fadrat textile and dynamic suede cloth. Uh, you could also spend a bit of extra cash on the steering wheel too. You can get it power adjusted and or heated, or you can trim it in a suede cloth and textile finish. As for driving stuff, well, Land Rover's offering its adaptive dynamics variable damping system, which allows you to alter suspension feel. Uh, this setup uses sensors that analyze body movement 100 times a second and wheel movement 500 times a second, ensuring that the damping should always be perfectly suited for the way you want to drive. It works through the various modes of that terrain response to driving mode system we mentioned earlier, and it can, at extra cost, be embellished with a further configurable dynamics mode which allows you to set up specific personal preferences with regard to throttle, steering and suspension feel. Uh, for those who are more interested in off-road dynamics, well, we'd recommend the wade sensing feature which shows your current fording depth on the center dash screen. Wade sensing can only be ordered if you've also paid extra for the 360 degree surround view camera system. And beyond that, well, if we were buying, there are a few things that we might want to put aside a little extra budget for. Bear in mind that a space saver spare wheel costs extra, so you'll need to budget for that if, in the event of a puncture, you don't want to be stuck by the side of the road with one of those irritating tyre inflation kits. Other practical features that you might want to specify include a powered tailgate, plus for the load area, a partition net, storage rails, a collapsible luggage organiser, a rubber mat and a liner tray. You can add in seat back stowage, a rear bumper protection cover and a modular click and go system for the rear of the front seats onto which can be clipped hooks, hangers, tray tables or tablet mounts. For those with dogs, there's a quilted load space liner, a full height luggage partition and even a spill resistant water bowl and a portable rinse system. A larger fuel tank can be ordered too. There's a stainless steel undershield, a power socket pack is available and you can have a smoker's pack if you haven't yet kicked up habit. Um, roof crossbars, they'll allow you to specify a roof box, a roof bike carrier and carriers for skis and snowboards. In addition, many owners will want the electrically deployable tow bar to be fitted or a simpler detachable one, in which case your dealer will also want to tell you about the advanced tow assist technology that you can have uh, that'll help you when you're hitched up and trying to park a trailer. With this setup, images from a rear-facing camera are relayed to the central touchscreen and the driver can manoeuvre using the Terrain Response 2 system's rotary controller. Uh, the advanced tow assist system will then autonomously steer the trailer into place. All the driver has to do is to operate the accelerator and brake pedals. On to aesthetics, wheel rim sizes tend to be key for Evoke buyers, so there's a wider than usual range of different alloy designs on offer in sizes from 17 to 21 inches. Uh, this particular car's uh, 20 inch five split spoke gloss mid silver diamond turned rims are particularly nice. Uh, whatever your rim choice, don't forget to add in locking wheel nuts. Uh, onto paintwork, bear in mind, unless you want your Evoke finished in solid Narvik black or Fuji white, you'll have to pay 
pay extra for one of the metallic finishes. There are eight shades on offer as part of what Land Rover calls a more grown-up palette, including this car's Kaikoura stone finish, plus there are two further premium metallic hues of Carpathian grey and silicon silver. Both black and silver coloured contrast roof options are available, although of course not if either black or silver is already your primary colour choice. Uh, you can have the mirror covers in black chrome or carbon fibre and the side vents in Narvik black. For the interior, you could add uh, chromed or illuminated tread plates, ash veneer or aluminium inlays, and an extended leather upgrade that extends leather across the dash and the doors. Uh, here we have a headliner in ebony mortzine, or you can have it trimmed in suede cloth. Uh, you might also want to look at premium carpet mats or black or aluminium gear shift paddles. On to safety, where, as you'd expect, most of the main bases are covered. Now, Land Rover hasn't bothered with offering a driver's knee bag, nor do you get the clever pedestrian airbag that's fitted to a Jaguar E-Pace, but twin front, side and curtain airbags are inevitably standard. Other expected passive safety features include Isofix rear child seat fastenings, uh, anti-whiplash head restraints, tyre pressure monitoring and the usual electronic assistance for traction and stability control. As usual, there's ABS braking with emergency brake assist to aid in panic stops and those are advertised to following motorists by automatically activating hazard flashes. What else? Well, Evoke occupants are surrounded by a high-strength steel safety cell and the reactions of the person in charge at the wheel will constantly be overseen by a standard driver condition monitor, which is there to search for signs of drowsiness. As for driving aids, well, hill start assist stops the car from drifting backwards on uphill junctions. There's engine drag torque control to reduce the chance of the kind of wheel lockup that might be caused by strong engine braking in slippery conditions. Cornering brake control varies braking force to each wheel to avoid unsettling the car too much if you're unwise enough to brake at speed in the middle of a corner. And roll stability control is integrated into the standard dynamic stability control system to reduce the possibility of a rollover during extreme turns at speed. Plus, if you have fitted a tow bar, then you'll benefit from trailer stability assist, which mitigates against trailer sway. All well and good, but what about the kind of clever camera-driven safety features that increasingly are present in all this model's main rivals? Well, of course, the Evoque has these too. Fitted as standard across the range is an emergency brake assist system which scans the road ahead as you drive in search of potential collision hazards, whether they be vehicles or pedestrians. Uh, if such a thing is detected, you'll be warned. Uh, now, if you don't respond or perhaps you aren't able to, then brake will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. In addition, all Evoke models get a lane keep assist system that will alert dozy drivers if they're veering out of their lanes on the highway. Plus, we particularly approve of the optimised assistance SOS emergency call feature. Now, that's built into the standard remote app package. Now, that will uh, transmit your location and your diagnostic data to the emergency service in the event of an accident, and that could be a lifesaver. By and large, you can't add other camera safety features as individual options, so what you get on top of the features we've already mentioned will depend on the spec level that you choose. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, S-Spec adds traffic sign recognition, while SE-Spec adds a clear exit monitor and a rear traffic monitor. HSE adds blind spot assist, high-speed emergency braking, and an adaptive cruise control with Q-Assist package. The Q-Assist element of that that is a feature that you can set in a traffic jam so that the car can handle irritating, very low speed, stop-start motoring without driver intervention. The K5 
key stat you need to know here doesn't for once relate to fuel figures, emissions readings or taxation status. It's this evokes exemplary residual value showing. Depreciation is one of the biggest costs of running a new car, yet it's also the easiest one to forget in the excitement of buying one. Now this little Range Rover model clings onto its value with class leading tenacity. Uh, independent experts reckon that a typical second generation Evoque variant will be able to retain up to 63% of its value after a typical three year 30,000 mile ownership period. That's much better than most premium competitors in this segment can manage and it's the main reason why PCP finance quotations for this car are so relatively affordable. All of this is just as well because it partly compensates for some of the issues this car has when it comes to the more usual running cost parameters. Uh, let's get to the key one. You might, like us, find it a little difficult to get your head around the fact that this second generation Evoque weighs virtually the same or in some cases actually even more than the Range Rover brand's much larger Velar model. That anomaly was easy to understand with the previous generation L538 series Mark I Evoque. Uh, that was saddled with the old Ford-derived D8 steel platform, and that dates back to Freelanders at the turn of the century. This new era L551 series Mark II model, though, gets a much trumpeted premium transverse architecture platform, and you'd think that would be lighter and much more sophisticated, but it's still fashioned from clumpy old steel. The aluminium underpinnings that undergird larger Range Rovers or while they were deemed too expensive for this one, which is difficult to understand uh, given that the Jaguar Land Rover conglomerate does offer an aluminium chassis in another of its more compact SUVs, the Jaguar F-Pace, and that doesn't cost an awful lot more. The reason that we're making such an issue of this is because of the contribution that all this makes to this evokes unwanted status as easily the heaviest compact SUV in the class. Top versions tip the scales at getting on for two tonnes, which is the most direct reason why this model line's fuel and efficiency readings just can't match those of the competition. And that's despite this second generation version's introduction of mild hybrid engine technology that uh, recovers braking energy and then uses it during low speed driving and to boost performance when you're accelerating. The system enhances the usual stop start feature by cutting the engine when rolling below 11 miles an hour, saving further fuel, although when you accelerate and the engine cuts back in, it does so with rather a jolt. Overall, Land Rover claims that the mild hybrid tech gives a 6% fuel economy improvement and it cuts CO2 by 8%, but it's not really enough to salvage a really class competitive set of fuel and CO2 readings. To give you some perspective on that, let's tell you that the D180 diesel Evoque that most customers tend to choose uh, manages up to 41.3 mpg on the WLTP combined cycle and up to 150 grams per kilometre of NEDC rated CO2. To give you some segment perspective, uh, a comparably performing direct rival like BMW's X1 xDrive 18D, which doesn't bother with mild hybrid tech, manages up to 55.4 mpg and up to 122 grams per kilometer. To be fair to Land Rover, the X1, like every other direct rival in this sector, is nothing like as capable off-road as an Evoque. Uh, you'll have to decide just how compensatory a factor that is for you. You don't gain much in efficiency terms by choosing a cheaper diesel Evoque model. The D150 mild hybrid all-wheel drive auto variant manages up to 41.9 mpg and 149 grams per kilometer. And the non-mild hybrid front-driven manual D150 manages 44.9 mpg and 143 grams per kilometer. For completion, uh, let's tell you that the top D240 diesel we're trying here returns up to 40.4 mpg and up to 163 grams per kilometre. In this test, we've been averaging a mid-30s mpg figure and we've been getting around 300 miles from the 54 litre fuel tank. The mild hybrid petrol versions are some way off the diesel readings, of course. A P200 model manages up to 30.7 mpg and 176 grams per kilometer. For the P250, it's up to 30.4 mpg and 180 grams per kilometer. And for the top P300, it's up to 30.3 mpg and 186 grams per kilometer. 
If you are set on fueling from the green pump, uh, we'd recommend the PHEV plug-in hybrid petrol derivative as a much better alternative. This makes a three-cylinder 1.5-litre petrol unit putting out 197 HP with a 107 HP electric motor. Whatever your engine choice, you'll increase your driving range significantly by specifying the available larger fuel tank option. You'll want to be taxation friendly with your choice of Evoke variant. Now we'd suggest the mid-range D180 diesel to be a good choice in this regard. Go easy on the options list and you should keep the list price under £40,000 and therefore avoid the government's £320 annual VED surcharge in years two to six of ownership of cars costing over that figure. Uh, below £40,000, the CO2 weighted first year road tax payment will be £205 that's normally rolled into the on-the-road price, uh, followed by the standard £135 a year. In terms of benefiting kind payments, uh, all of oak models fall into the maximum 37% band. All of the fuel and CO2 figures we quoted earlier assume that you've chosen the most frugal of the four terrain response to driving modes, Eco, for your trip, and that's a setting that, as the name suggests, adjusts all of the car systems for maximum efficiency. Beyond that, uh, your driving is clearly going to play a crucial part in the efficiency process, and that's something that this evokes technology wants to help you to improve. The Touch Pro infotainment screen's Eco Data section offers an energy impact driving style display to help you here. And it shows you your recent efficiency success when it comes to three areas, accelerator, speed and engine, and brake. There's also a history screen uh, that graphically shows how your running cost figures from recent journeys have stacked up. And rather cringingly, it awards you a little trophy for the most frugal one. As for engine technology, well, the diesel engines, like the units you'll find in every rival, use AdBlue. That's a urea-based liquid that uh, is squirted into the hot exhaust to neutralize many of the harmful gases that would otherwise be blown into the surrounding atmosphere. Uh, the AdBlue tank will need to be filled up regularly, uh, although it can last up to 9,000 miles, and your Land Rover dealer will charge you around £30 to fill it up. Uh, if you've taken out one of the brand's service plans, though, those top-ups are included free. A lot of Evoke buyers will fund their car through a lease deal, and Land Rover offers its own finance for this. Uh, most of these packages include the cost of insurance, but if you buy the car with your own money or you decide to arrange cover for yourself, uh, you'll want to know which group your car will sit in. Uh, the lowest powered petrol and diesel models start at Group 26. The ratings then climb through Groups 29 to 39 for the R-Dynamic, the D180 and HSE P300 models, respectively. Uh, that's a chunk above the ratings that apply to directly comparable rivals. That only leaves the warranty, an unremarkable three-year unlimited mileage deal. Uh, that is the same as BMW offers, but it's better than you get from Audi and Lexus, who limit their cover to 60,000 miles. Uh, there's also an in-control protect service, which allows you to monitor vital stats on your car from your smartphone, and which will guide the breakdown services to your Evoque should it ever have a problem. Also included is European cover and a promise to get you on your way as soon as possible in your own car or in a loan vehicle if the required repair will take longer than four hours. We're short of British success stories just at present, but the Evoque model line is one of them. Land Rover reckons the original version of this car pioneered the compact SUV segment. It didn't, of course, but it did redefine what a premium model in this sector could be. This second generation Evoque is as stylish and capable as its predecessor, but it manages at the same time to be much more of a Range Rover style product, making more accessible the class and cutting edge design of the larger Velar. It's even more desirable as a result. 
It's true that some rivals offer a more engaging tarmac driving experience, but the Evoque's greater emphasis on luxury and comfort is one that we believe most likely buyers will prefer. We think the ride quality is class leading. Now sure, you pay for that, especially if you delve into the extensive options list, but this car's value proposition is strong in terms of its monthly finance figures, and that's thanks to an outstanding set of residual value predictions. Which is just as well because running cost efficiency isn't a particular strong point by class standards. Uh, the new mild hybrid engines are hobbled by this car's rather prodigious curb weight and by an auto gearbox that's too often either sluggish or slightly erratic when you need it to be quick-witted. These issues aren't serious enough to be game changers though if, as is quite possible, you really like what Land Rover's created here. The lovely cabin, the clever tech such as the clear sight rear view mirror and off-road capability that rivals can't even approach. All the compelling reasons why you might want an Evoque. In all these areas it remains the class of the field. But which field? Can a small, smart SUV priced just like a larger one really make sense if you're not urban-based? Well, the order books suggest that an awful lot of people think it is. Ultimately, what we have here is a welcome step forward in Evoke development. It'll please those who like the original, but it might also charm folk who didn't. Whichever camp you're in, if you need to match style with substance in a small SUV of this sort, it's hard to think of a better place to start your search.